thank you so much. Um, first, I want to do a disclaimer, and that is if there's any um, physicist who is a quantum mechanics purist, then you should probably leave. Um, because I don't think that advances understanding for people that are in uh, clinical medicine. So I'm going to stick with simple mechanical analogies to explain things. Um, my goals today are pretty simple. I have a game plan uh, because I've got to move through pretty quickly to get to the really fun stuff. Uh, we're going to develop a basic understanding of where a signal comes from, exactly what's T1 and T2, understand and recognize differences between the T2, FSC, and GRE, and when we use which each one for and for which. We're going to talk about the workhorse of neuroimaging and version recovery and how the images are made and some common artifacts. Um, at that point, I'm going to break for questions. So if you could hold questions till then, if there are any, um, I think that's going to help me move along. Um, plus, I'm probably likely getting ready to answer the question anyway. Um, at the end, we're going to do some fun things for the residents. We're going to list uh, five substances that have high signal on the T1 weighted images, which is clinically useful for you, and then recognize and understand the appearance of blood products. So um, I gave this lecture at, at UCLA. And the first thing the student said to me, why do you call it proton imaging? There's protons in every nucleus. I'm like, yeah, I've got a point there. Um, so the reason when a radiologist says proton, we're referring to the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, nothing else. That's what we're referring to. Um, when we say, we often will use the term spin interchangeably. You'll hear us say spins. What are we talking about? Well, this is a quantum mechanics term. And the bottom line is that nuclei that have an odd number of protons or neutrons will have net spin. That means they'll act like a little bar magnet and can line up with the main magnetic field. We don't have to use the proton. We could use sodium or P31, multi-nuclear scanners now available in the marketplace already. So imagine making an image of sodium influxing into ischemic tissue or making an image of your uh, ATP stores. We could do that, but we're never going to use it for clin clinical imaging because there's just not enough of them. So the signal is very weak, and therefore the only reason this is going to work is because, you know, 70 percent of your brain's made out of water. That's why it's going to work. So what we're, what we're imaging then, what we're using for the NMR um, experiment is the proton, the nucleus that's acting like a little bar magnet. So as you probably have seen before, um, in the presence of a strong magnetic field, we say that the proton lines up and begins to persist like a spinning top. Um, the frequency of this procession is extremely important, and it has a name. It's called the Larmor frequency. And this is the only equation I'm going to show you and care about because it's fundamental to all of MR physics. So what it means at its base is that the frequency of precession is equal to the gyromagnetic ratio that's different for any single nucleus to be different than hydrogen than it would be for phosphorus times the magnetic field strength. Uh, so it means like if you're in a 1.5 Tesla, your, your protons are processing at 63.9 megahertz. You get into three Tesla and it's twice the frequency. All right, so now I've covered the idea of why it's nuclear and why it's magnetic. And now let's talk about resonance. So far, I've done nothing to create an image. I've done nothing to get any information out of the system. So I've got to put energy in and then listen for the signal that comes back to figure out what the tissue is composed of. And this happens by resonance. And the analogy that's given is if um, you're pushing a log in a swing, if you push it exactly the right frequency, there's an optimal transfer of energy. And that's called resonance. It's a natural phenomenon. Needless to say, the frequency of the, of the RF pulse that we're going to put in now is at the Larmor frequency. So let's look for a second what's inside the magnet. It's important that you know what the gradient coils, when we say gradient, it's important you understand exactly what that is. Um, the main magnetic field is set up by these miles and miles of superconducting wire. They set up a main magnetic field in the direction of the long axis of your body, and we'll call that the Z or longitudinal axis. It just inside this main coil, there's a set of three gradient coils, X, Y, and Z gradient. <coughs> And what they do, as their name says, is that they superimpose a gradient um, on the magnetic field. So the main magnetic field is always on in a superconducting magnet, even if you heard nothing. 
Uh, when we begin to image, the gradient flows are rapidly going to be ramped up with huge amounts of current and, and polarity reversed and turned on and off. And that actually causes them to shake. So that's the source of all the knocking noise, as you probably know. Uh, the gradient performance determines how fast you can image, how, what's the highest resolution you can get. So the gradient coils are obviously very, very important. Um, let's focus for a second on the Z axis coil and how that's going to work. So if I run current uh, through this coil, we know for the right hand rule, it's going to set up a magnetic field. It's going to increase the main magnetic field at this end. And then at the other end, if I run current in the opposite direction, it would subtract from the main magnetic field, thus creating a gradient of magnetic field strength. Now we know from the Lorimer equation that the frequency is going to be directly related to that field strength. So what this means is when I turn on the z-axis coil, I'm going to have your the protons in your toes are going to be processing slightly greater than those in your nose. So now when we send in the radio frequency, we're not going to blast your entire body. We would just be heating you up for no good reason. Plus, we wouldn't know where the signal was coming from when it comes out. So we'll first turn on a slice select and choose a narrow range of frequencies, say, for instance, if you want to image, you know, just your brain. Now, look at the arrangement of the coils. I could turn on the x-axis and make sagittal images. I could turn on the y and create a gradient from front to back and create coronal images. Or I could turn on any combination of the coils at the same time and get any possible uh, imaging plane. All right, so the first thing that happens in the MR experiment is we turn on the slice select gradient. And then we're going to transmit the RF pulse in that's at the same frequency. We're going to select that slice. Okay, so what does the 90 degree or radio frequency pulse do that sit in at that frequency? We set up this longitudinal magnetization. It's in the long axis. It's going to rotate it to a transverse, 90 degree transverse plane. And that new magnetic field is called B1. Why we care about that is because there's a loop of wire here that is our detector. That's the only way we can detect signal from the body, okay? So 90 degree flip angle, radio frequency pulse, increases <laughs> longitudinal, increases transverse magnetization. The other thing it does is it forces phase coherence. So right now they're canceling, every proton is out of phase with another. There's no net signal. It forces all the protons to process in phase. And when I say all, I just mean, of course, the ones that are uh, going to be active. So let's look what that means. The RF pulse, again, so important, creates transverse magnetization. The procession of the protons is in phase. And it's the sweep of this magnetization that's solely responsible for detectable signal. So the RF pulse goes in for like about five milliseconds. That's it, very brief. Once we turn it off, you know, what do you think happens? Well, obviously it's a high energy state. It's not gonna continue. So the spins are gonna want to go back into equilibrium. The way they go back into equilibrium is described by two time constants, T1 and T2. You've heard these before, what are they? They're time constants. So the first one, T1 is pretty easy to understand. Is, one, is the tendency of the protons to want to realign with a main magnetic field. A T1 is defined as the time for recovery of 63% of that total magnetization. So let's look at a T1 weighted image and we can see fat's the brightest and CSF's the darkest. Then it wouldn't surprise you to know that the T1 curve of fat is gonna look something like this, 300 millisecond T1. For uh, CSF, it's going to be like four seconds, which is ridiculously slow. It's forever. And that's why CSF is dark. It doesn't recover signal quickly. And therefore, there's nothing to, for the next 90 degree pulse comes along. There's nothing to convert into the transverse plane. All right, let's look at this. This is a third ventricular colloid cyst. And you can see that it, ha it is hyper intense. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, could there be blood product? Well, usually not. When we look at pathology of colloid cysts, it's usually because of increased protein. So what is common then about fat and about things like a proteinaceous colloid cyst that would make both right, right? That's not intuitively obvious, is it? The answer is just like the reason the protons got the energy was because of resonance, they also optimally get rid of the energy and return to longitudinal magnetization 
if there's something in their environment that rotates near the lower frequency. So the long aliphatic side chains of fat happen to rotate at roughly the lower frequency. It just happens to be so. That's why fat is bright. The colloid cysts can be very watery, as you know, and be dark on T1, or they can be bright like this. When we look at the protein content in these cysts, it is high. So what is happening is the water molecules are interacting with the protein, protein via hydrogen bonding. Their molecular tumbling rate is slowing down close to the lower frequency. If that happens, then they will be bright. Okay. So now let's look at the other form of relaxation, which is called T2 relaxation. Uh, this is the relaxation that happens as signal loss. This is now an exponential decay curve. This is signal loss. So after the 90 degree pulse, everything is flipped down into the transverse plane, presumably. Now there's rapid loss or dephasing. So what causes that loss of signal? And we look at a T2 weighted image, we can see that the CSF is incredibly bright. So it's not gonna surprise you that the T2 curve, if I drew it here, would look like this. T2 of around two seconds. If I drew the T2 for um, cortical bone, it would start lower because there's less proteins, protons, and it would decrease just incredibly rapidly. You barely would even be able to see it. So this is a nice example. Here's the main magnetic field. 90 degree pulse comes converting, creating transverse magnetization, and now it rapidly gets out of phase. When it's completely out of phase like this, there is no signal. That's black on a T2 weighted image. So what is it about CSF then that makes it be so bright on a T2 weighted image? Why is its T2 so long? And the answer is there's not a lot, the, the molecules are quite distant apart in water in compared to solids where they're held rigidly together. There's not a lot of chance for interaction of one proton with the other in water, as opposed to a rigid solid state where the T2 values are just incredibly short. All right, here's a colloid cyst that is black. So we would suspect that it's much less water. We suspect that the contents are somewhat like crankcase oil as they've been described. And, and you would likely be right. Maybe there's blood products as well, but usually it's just incredibly viscous and not a lot of free water. All right, so there's a problem and that um, if we think of what the tissue is composed of and we measure the T2, what we see in the lab is it's incredibly shorter and this is called T2 star. So T2 star, I want you to think T2 observed. Why does the signal decay much more rapidly than we would expect? So the answer is uh, this is due to all possible causes of dephasing. T2 decay is inherent in the tissue. So T2 star means we have all causes, T2 inherent to the tissue and local magnetic field and homogeneity. The magnet's not perfect. Maybe there's something in your environment that's causing you to see a different magnetic field. Maybe you're a proton near hemosiderate, you're near pedicle screws, you're near the skull base. Any of those things are going to cause local magnetic field and homogeneity and therefore rapid, rapid signal loss. So it would be nice if there was some way we could get rid of this because then we could just see what the true T2 is of a tissue. And it just so happens there is a way. So there's two, this gets to the two main sequences, uh, two main families of pulse sequences, GREs and spin echoes, and why we use one and versus the other, what they show us. So the thing you need to know is that for spin echo, there's going to be the 90 degree pulse and then another radio frequency pulse that's going to get rid of all local magnetic field and homogeneity. Whereas the other type of sequence is called a GRE and it's going to be a gradient reversal and it will be very sensitive to these T2 star effects, local magnetic field and homogeneity and signal will not be recovered in that particular case. <coughs> so let's look at a spin echo. Uh, there goes the 90 degree pulse. Here's the rapid dephasing due to T2 star effect. And at the 180 causes it to reform at a time exactly equal to the time between the 90 and the 180 degree pulses. So this is called a sequence diagram. This tells us the radiologist everything we need to know. It's a spin echo. There's a 90, 180, and then there's an echo. This means we repeat multiple, multiple times. The TE is defined as the time for the 90 degree pulse to the echo. The TR from 190 degree pulse to the other. 
Important thing, signal loss due to magnetic field inhomogeneity is refocused by this pancake flipping or time reversal. All right, so when I was a resident, it took forever to do a brain MRI because we only got one echo to collect data every single time every, for every single TR. And that was crazy. Um, we couldn't do any high resolution imaging when we first started. So then fast spin echo came along. The reason it's fast is because we're gonna do multiple 180s, which are gonna create multiple echoes for every TR. We could create hundreds of them. Um, so the imaging data that we collect goes into an imaging space. I'm not gonna discuss it because people uh, spend their entire lives talking about case space. <clears throat> But in any event, every single time I collect an echo, I'm going to fill one line. I have to fill this entire case space, inverse Fourier transform it to get an image. What do I want you to know? In a 2D image, there are two, two, two dimensions, right? Uh, one will be the frequency encoding and one will be phase encoding. It will not necessarily be X and Y. I can, sw I can switch that, switch it around, doesn't matter. <laughs> so the frequency encoding is pretty much what you would think. I turn on my X gradient coil and I make the protons on one side of your body persist faster than those on the mm. other. So now when the signal comes out, I can tell which side of your body it's coming from. For phase encoding, I'm gonna turn that on and off and imprint a memory or phase shift depending on location. So for every single proton in your body, it's gonna have a unique frequency and a unique phase. And that's how the magnet's gonna figure out where the signal came from in the first place. So what do you need to know about this? Why do you care? Well, because it can be useful. <laughs> Frequency encoding or readout is, happens very rapidly. You're never gonna see motion artifact, but what you might see is chemical shift artifact. Because fat processes lower frequency than water, you might see a black line at the interface between a fat and water. <laughs> and that is a big clue that it's fat. Okay. Um, what happens in phase encoding? Well, a lot of artifacts because it takes minutes, whereas the uh, frequency encoding takes like you know, 15 milliseconds, right? So um, this is very, very slow. You're going to get ghosting artifacts. So, you know, like when you inject contrast in the transverse sinus and you have that smudge across the posterior fossa and you're like, well, that's annoying. Mm -hmm. um, well, the good thing is it tells you the vessel's patent. So. Uh, so as with all artifacts, it's a problem, it obscures, it, it takes away from information, but it also delivers information. And that's a common theme uh, in MRI imaging. So let's look for a second at inversion recovery. Uh, this is something people don't know. Did you know that a T2 flare image is a T1 weighted image, that it has T1 weighting in it? Probably don't, you don't think about it. But with inversion recovery, we can see now that it's a spin echo, because here's our 90, 180, and echo. But it's going to start with a 180. So there's the inversion. It's going to start with complete inversion below the baseline. And now here comes CSF with its very, very slow T1, which means that this is T1 weighting. If I pick, if I pick the TI, which is the time between the 90 and the inversion, the inversion pulse and the 90 degree pulse, for CSF here, then there's been no recovery of longitudinal magnetization. It's zero. So there's not going to be any signal when we hit it with the 90 degree pulse. There's no signal from the CSF. I can null it. If I pick a short TI, I can null fat. If I pit, did two 180s, I could null both white matter and CSF and have what's called a double inversion recovery and have a wonderful sequence for looking for cortical malformation <laughs> or demyelinating disease with both CSF and myelin suppressed. All right, so um, another thing, the CSF time, the, the magnet doesn't know if there's blood or pus in the CSF. So all of those things, as, as I showed you with the colloid cyst, are gonna shift that T1 relaxation curve of CSF to the left. It would no longer be suppressed. And that's the reason why flare is so incredibly sensitive for the presence of gadolinium, like four times more sensitive than T1 post GAD, because of this very strong sensitivity to the shifting of the T1 relaxation curve. So as you know, flare is an incredibly important sequence because of the suppression of CSF. We can see lesions that we might otherwise overlook become very obvious. So all flare is doing, T2 flare, 
is trying to suppress CSF by, the, by choosing that inversion time that we could calculate if we wanted the, the, the T1 of CSF's fourth is four seconds times 0.69, and that gives me a TI, what I want to use ideally. So let's look at some flare, T2 flare pitfalls. Uh, the first case is normal, all right? Normal brain MRI. And anybody who's been looking at flare sequences, you know this happens. So why does it happen? Why did flare fail me? Why did I lose suppression around the brain stem and in the fourth ventricle? Why did that happen? Um, and I'll, I'll tell you the answer to speed it up. Um, the answer is that inversion pulse is slice selective. The slice select gradient is on. So it's only going to invert the, the spins in that slice. So if there's any inflow of unsaturated spins, this is what you're going to get, right? So what can I do about it? Well, first of all, I'd look at all the other sequences and be sure there's nothing there. It's going to have an artifact, right? But I'm going to look at the T2s to see do I, if, I, if I'm concerned or not. The other thing you could do would be a 3D flare, because now we're not slice selecting. We're doing a large volume so that there's a greater inversion of the CSF. I could do a larger frequency inversion pulse, but in any event, there's ways to get around it and fleet the 3D flare is probably the best. Okay, case two, I hope that this looks abnormal to you, but it is a little bit subtle. That's a T2 flare. Remember, we should have good CSF suppression in our cell side. And look at this particular case, look in the cell side, see the high signal? All right, that's very, very abnormal. Um, a radiologist might say clinical correlation. Does the patient have meningitis? Is there subarachnoid hemorrhage? In this particular case, the patient was normal, but they were under sedation with 100% inhaled oxygen. And so oxygen is weakly paramagnetic. And if you have high enough FiO2 levels of 100%, then you can actually get this increased oxygen in the CSF and it can shift that T1 recovery curve of CSF to the left, thus no longer nulling the CSF. <clears throat> All right, so that's kind of cool. Um, what would I do about it? Uh, I would look at my T1s post GAD. Is there any meningeal enhancement? Is there anything to make me more concerned? Or is this possibly just due to the inhaled oxygen? All right, here's a, an interesting case where we completely lost CSF suppression in the anterior part of the brain. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Why would there be subarachnoid hemorrhage just there? Why would there be <laughs> meningitis just in this location? So it looks artifactual because it makes no sense. So we look at the other images that I didn't show you, and on the GRE sequence, there was complete loss of signal in the frontal lobes. And it turns out the guy has a BB in his ethmoid sinuses. So flare is very sensitive and it can have artifacts. And my, the most important thing I want to say to you is just because there's an artifact doesn't mean the patient's normal. And I saw a shunt valve once and there was loss of suppression on the flare around the shunt valve. But the question was, was there infection? Um, well, there was, question, there was an unquestionably loss of CSF suppression. It was artifactual looking, no question about it. But it was also infected with a small subdural in the area that was a subdural in Paima. So the point is, this is corrupt data. This is corrupt data. That's what it is. When you have an artifact like that, you can't count on the flare anymore. That's really, that's really all it means. So look at your other sequences. All right, now I want to talk about T2 star imaging. You might know this as the heme sequence. So in this particular type of imaging, we're not going to have that other 90, uh, 180 degree pulse. So there, here's our slice like radiant that goes on. Here's our radio frequency pulse. And now we're going to turn on the gradient coil in the X direction. And we're going to make this echo dephase. We're going to make the signal dephase. We're going to force it to happen. And then we're going to switch the polarity and force the echo to reform. So in GRE, the signal is lower. It's not as robust as an echo. And the other thing is that the only thing we've rephased is, is only because of what we've defaced. And so here's what I mean by that. So this is, say, the right side of your body. This is the left if the, if the uh, defacing is caused by the X gradient coils. So this rabbit is on the strong side of the magnetic field. This rabbit, the tortoise is on the weak. So when he fires the gun, that's the start of the D phase gradient. The rabbit's gonna race off because he's seeing a higher magnetic field. 
Uh, when he says run back, that's the start of the rephase. So now if they only if they're only defaced because of this magnetic field um, gradient rephasing defasing situation reversal of the gradient, then they're going to reach the finish line at the same time. Therefore, I've done nothing to get rid of signal loss due to metal, hemosiderin. I haven't done anything about it. There's loss also signal the skull base. I haven't fixed that. So here, that's terrible, but it's also beautiful, isn't it? Here's a fast spin echo T2, and we see area of um, abnormal signal in the frontal lobe. We see volume loss, though, so this is an old injury. And there's a little bit of decreased signal in this region. So we go and look at our heme sequence, or our, our T, or this is just a 2D um, GRE, and we see that it got bigger and blacker. We call this blooming, and that means we suspect that there's, heme, there's blood products, specifically hemocytor in this case. But also notice that there's a big artifact running across the front where we've lost signal. That's from the frontal sinus, okay? Very sensitive to magnetic field and homogeneity. What about the difference here? See the uh, signal in the sagittal sinus is bright and here it's black? Well, which one is real? Which one do you believe? In fast spin echo imaging, remember it's slice selective, the 90 and 180. So any spins that are in this plane might get hit by the 90, but certainly if it's normal flowing blood, it's flowed on by the time of the 180. So normal flowing blood should be black. That's why, not because it doesn't have protons. Of course it has protons. On the GRE sequence, one reason is because the gradient reversal is not slice, re slice selective. It's not slice selective. So everything will be rephased, including the spins that may not even be in that plane anymore. Now, this is called an SWI, or susceptibility weighted image, and it has five times increased sensitivity for hemorrhage inside the brain. Because, as you not, probably won't be surprised now, this is a GRE sequence, okay? So at its base, the root pulse sequence is a GRE, but we're layering on top of it phase sensitive information. So sensitive now that we can see uh, deoxyhemoglobin. Why? Because it has magnetic susceptibility. All right, so magnetic susceptibility, I keep saying that. Why does that happen? It is because of unpaired orbital electrons. I don't expect that you might care about that. So I just put in red things that can really screw up your T2 star weighted images. All right, so paramagnetic deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, gadolinium at high concentration and oxygen, super paramagnetic ferritin and hemocytorin with like 10,000 unpaired electrons. Ferromagnetic means when the metal gets in the magnet, domains line up and it becomes a permanent magnet. So that's the problem, uh, why metal really messes up our images. So on the spine images, you probably have noticed you always get two sets of T2s, right? You get a fast spin echo set and a GRE set. The GRE set has this very nice myelographic appearance. It also shows the internal architecture of the spinal cord better than the fast spin echo image. So this would be better than for looking for demyelinating plaques. This would be better for looking for something within the CSF because with the fast spin echo image, anything flowing through the plane of suction, be it pulsating CSF or flowing blood, is going to turn black. Same situation. You might have been in that plane for the 90, but you're not there for the 180. No signal. So this is going to cause signal loss, and this becomes very annoying. All right, so uh, what about this case? In the spine, we know we often get metal implants. Um, this patient's had a posterior, uh, has had posterior fusion, instrumented fusion, and the GRE sequence then is completely uh, confounded by this. Whereas the fast spin echo, because of the multiple 180s, getting rid of magnetic field homogeneity again and again, making it more bulletproof, we can see now that there's a posterior fluid collection. All right, how else do we use this? And, and Roy was talking to me about this, and I think he's, I think he's absolutely spot on as always. Uh, he likes to look um, for, at a disc herniation on the axial GREs. If it's really, really bright, then that suggests to him strongly that this is a soft, soft disc herniation or more acute. Um, if, on the other hand, it's very black and it gets blacker on the GRE, so this suggests to us that there might be calcification, or it could be just that the disc is terribly desiccated. We tend to overcall this, 
But if you see something really black back behind the disc and it gets darker on the GREs, you might want to do a CT scan if it matters to you, and I suspect it might, all right? So how could I tell these were GRE images? Well, for starters, the flowing blood is bright. That's a dead giveaway. The internal architecture of the spinal cord is well seen. And the rest of structures, uh, the tissue contrast is poor. The margin of the bone is not well seen because it's also um, got magnetic susceptibility and is blooming, getting bigger and blacker. So uh, any questions? I'm at 30 minutes and that's that's really good. Uh, any questions right now? And otherwise I'm gonna move on to uh, <laughs> work T1s and blood products. Okay. Uh why are higher magnets like this? Why is, hasn't the seven Tesla or five Tesla been practical? There is the it, at least the physics answer. Very, it. very good question. All right, so the uh, possible signal that you can get is to the square of the magnetic field strength. So when you go from 1.5 to three, you didn't increase two times signal, you increased four times signal, right? So why not just keep going, right? Wonderful. Well, the other thing that happens is that the T1 of tissues increases with increasing magnetic field strength. So that's not a terrible thing. We can adjust pulse sequences. You might have noticed that on the three Tesla, we don't just do regular old sagittal T1s. We do inversion recovery, flare T1s. And the reason for that is because we need to get increased tissue contrast. We do MPGRs. Uh, MP rage. We do signal, we do different types of sequences. So the T1 of tissues is going to continue to get longer. We would have to adjust our pulse sequences and they probably would be longer pulse sequences. So that's a problem. Uh, the other thing that can happen is when you rapidly change these gradients, <coughs> just, uh, you can induce uh, stimulation within the nerves in your body. So people at 70 will talk about getting creepy crawly sensation over the dorsum of their nose or the back of their hand. Um, obviously, it's more dangerous. It's harder to cite that kind of a magnet. Um, anything else, Roy? No, it's artifact, right? It, it, yeah. You, yeah. you sacrifice getting rid of the artifact with, with time. Yeah. So you end up spending more time to get the images. <laughs> yeah. total amount of radiation. Oh, fantastic. Outside. Fantastic point. So yeah, so what he's talking about is the uh, SAR, or the specific absorption rate is, is a kind of a hard number to come by. Uh, but in any event, it, it takes into account how big the patient is um, and their circumference or shape. It takes into account a lot of things, but the radio frequency pulse is the main source of heating rather than the gradient reversals. So, uh, you know, we love our fast spin echo T2, but think about that 180, 180, 180. That's an incredibly strong amount of radio frequency energy. We're getting around that now by changing the flip angle and doing what's called variable flip angle. So we're not depositing so much energy because it's directly related to the strength of that RF pulse. Um, for 7T, it's gonna be, it's gonna be even worse. There's gonna be more artifact <coughs> metal in plants definitely true. Um, anything else, Roy? You get better signal, right? But you still yep. get better signal. You still have more higher resolution. So that's why we're trying to get a 5T more than, I think it's going to be a little bit better workhorse than a 7T. I think a 70. <laughs> yeah, is, too, it, too many problems. It, right? It's a huge overhaul and it yeah. so, becomes a lot of problems. Sorry. Um, so why the is there anything to do with smaller animal or smaller tissue, part of the tissues compared to the actual human that make a different decision in terms of what, how high a test score is going to use? And for example, um, the truth is that for human, we use three test scores pretty much. <laughs> but we use the seven test scores to do Absolutely. My study. I have a very good answer for you on this. Um, the larger the area that we're trying to create a homogeneous magnetic field, the harder it is to do. So if you're only trying to get an animal this big inside a tube, I can get a really homogeneous magnetic field pretty easy in that particular circumstance. The second you put a person into your magnet, I don't care how good that homogeneous the field was, though, you know, the physicist one point per million. 
The second you put a person in, you've distorted that and immediately the gradient coils start trying to adjust and, and shim and get that magnetic field in the ISO center as homogeneously as possible. If you increase the inhomogeneity in the, in the magnet uh, by one part per million, the T2 decay acceleration you're gonna get is incredible. You're gonna lose signal like crazy, which is like really shocking, I know, but, but that is one of the biggest reasons why small animals, we can go way high Plus, I guess we don't care about neural stimulation either, maybe. So. It, it, it took over 10 years to go from a 60 centimeter bore yeah. in three Tesla to a 70, yeah. just, just 10, 10 centimeters with, with all the technology in the world. Just that took 10 years to be so able to. That means that the same the volume, <laughs> meaning the small animals uh, use a lower. Uh, use the 3T or 1.5 will not be able to see what we're supposed to see. No, no not at all. He's just saying that that um, to make that one of the largest sources of uh, signal de signal decrease on the T2 weighted images is T2 star. That means magnetic field and homogeneity. What we're saying is that you can't get a really homogeneous field easily with large bore. So if I try to take that to 70, it's going to get really hard. I mean, first thing they're gonna probably do is start shrinking down the size of the floor. And that's, that's why those walls are 60 centimeters, right? So really in an animal, it's very, very easy to keep everything homogeneous. You'll get the same amount of signal you would get, but if you put the same animal into a human bank, it's gonna be very hard to have the same homogeneous field. That's gonna be very, very tough. The second question is uh, how much of this would, as it goes, uh, how much you're gonna impact actual cells uh, survival or, I mean, or any negative impact. You're saying how how clinically impactful clinical is it is impactful. to increase resolution? Cells, it hmm. it's, it's a good question. I mean, we, we keep changing things. We keep coming up with things every day. You know, I mean, right now, um, obviously, I think we're, where we're headed um, is we're headed for a sequence. We'll run one sequence mm -hmm. and then we'll use AI and we'll reconstruct every single possible other sequence that you wanted, right? Yeah. And then we'll do multi parametric or bolus GAD. We'll get like, you know, we'll have flow data, we'll have spectroscopy data, we'll feed so, huge amounts of data in the computer, and then we'll have a model, a convolutional neural network, analyzed, <coughs> maybe classified, maybe not. Uh, but I think this is uh, this is where we're headed. Right now, deep learning is already being used in the magnet Roy has, which is just, I'm so excited about that. Um, it's called Air Recon uh, DL. So, so we, have, we have been able to use AI to reduce the filling of the case space in half. Yeah. So wow. we're, we're, we're going from sequences that, that were six minutes to sequences that are two and a half minutes. Super exciting. And, and we will go even lower than that. And, but uh, it, it's not easy, but... But that will correct a lot of the SAR that, 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 that we were talking that's right. about. And that's why when we, we were discussing, for example, with, uh, with, uh, with um, about a, a low Tesla magnet, we, we, we would really, really want that. And uh, you, you can only correct for, for, for the loss of, 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 uh, of gradient so much. It's the, I think the higher, it, it's a balance between high field and and uh, and resolution and, and that's all what mri is it's, it's a speed test and resolution test. yeah that, that's what you get and that's where that's where ai has been like really impressive uh in our field you know if you look at like the last 700 uh fda clearances it's uh, 80 80 percent or more have been in the field of radiology not surprising right if you say it's an ai that's that's all us so i think that's super cool uh, it's actually increasing resolution, decreasing imaging time, increasing signal to noise. And that's like the holy grail for imaging, because if I put you in there for hours and repeated this experiment again and again and again, I could get beautiful images. I mean, like textbook, gorgeous images. But obviously, that's the problem, right? And it's not going to happen. So we could increase the field strength, but we will also increase artifacts. No question about that. We'll have trouble with uh, the you know implants, metal implants will cause greater problems. So it's just it, you know it takes with one hand, gives you know takes away with the other. So yeah. One last question, Paul. Um, so where do you foresee this in terms of scanner turning into much more sort of a, a patient work? I mean, the other word that 
the long but inside the tiny tube, even though, you know, a lot of people probably were comfortable with the coil around the head, yeah. but 90% of people will hate to be inside that tiny tunnel. So the other word is that strength is yes there, but what do you foresee this is gonna go? Well, if we can get to the point where people could be happy we, uh, using synthetic MRI, where we do one, uh, one sequence and then we synthesize the other ones using AI, then you could get imaging time down. <laughs> So they wouldn't have to get as long, I guess. It's only yeah, well, then, then the, the, the other thing is that but the whole sequence lasts like 10 minutes, so a little bit of motion screws up the whole study. Oh, yeah. Right? So, but, <laughs> but well, now, but I maybe. Think to your question, the, the, the idea is we'll be, we still are going to be confounded by the sizes that we have right now. We, I, don't, I think 70 centimeter coils are the biggest we're going to have. What they're doing with the coils is they're making it more flexible. So now, the clothes we're using for body look like a blanket, they're soft, and that they're going to be something very similar done to brain, so they don't feel like they're right. they, they yeah, prefer this coil that this coil array that that is solid and that they're trapped in there. But right now, that's the best solution that humans have. The yeah. open magnet solutions that we have are very non homogeneous, that, very that's why they have not hit the market. That's why low Tesla magnets are so few. So, so, so um, you so little in, in real clinical scenarios. Definitely not in the hospital. <coughs> it's huge. It's if your patient if your patient can't fit in a high field, then that's a good reason. That's yeah. about it. All right. So, so I, I want to quickly so go on. Follow up on Rock's question: Is there evidence from small animal studies that seven T causes cell death in rodents or whatever? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I could, you know, there would be tissue heating. Um, it did, probably depends on the engineering, the pulse sequences, right? Um, I mean, because we can decrease heating. Like if you've got a deep brain stimulator in, there's certain sequences that we will not run. We'll go into like what's called a low star mode. Um, so there, it probably has less to do with the, the high field than it has to do with what sequences they're running. And I guess you probably could cook them. Yeah. I, I think that, yeah, that that that's why you have the, the <laughs> salt, right? So that's why you have a measurement to see what's the absorb ratio of the, that you're going to get from the magnetic field of heat. And you avoid those. I mean, you just have to avoid that. Yeah. But if you, if you put it in a huge magnet with, with low, low SAR, because you, you tweak it, if you could put it in a 1.5 Tesla, just cook them up with, with very high SAR, you could do the same amount of injury. I think you, you you have to tweak it to avoid the injury. Yeah, sure. That's it. That's good. Excellent. All right. I want to quickly move on for the residents. I think you'll like this. Um, most people, most radiologists have like a quick differential diagnosis for if I see something really, really bright on T1 weighted image, what do I think it is? And then blood products. Why? Because it's useful and because it's going to be a boards question, right? So that's why we want to talk about that. So here's your, here's your list. Uh, we've already talked about fat being hyper intense. The only blood product that's hyper intense on T1 is methemoglobin. That sounds like a, a board's question. And that is a subacute uh, form of blood. Melanin uh, can be bright on the T1. About, uh, only about a third of melanoma mets actually are bright on T1. But nonetheless, I would think about it if you had a lesion that was bright. Protein-rich fluid. Okay, that's important because, like, if you have a lesion of the pituitary gland and it's bright on the T1-weighted image, then you want to at least consider the possibility it might be a rhabdis collapse cyst. Uh, atypical dermoid is the white dermoid, um, which interestingly does not restrict on diffusion. I thought that was, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so maybe it's really a, a neuroenteric cyst. I don't know, but in any event, slow-flowing blood. Uh, calcification in certain states. What do I mean by that? Well, if you've got a rock like meningioma, that's not going to be bright. It's going to be black. But if you've got like finely dispersed calcification of the basal ganglia, sometimes that will have hydro, it will have an interaction with hydrogen bonding with water. The water will slow down close to the Larmor frequency. If that happens, it's going to get bright. And of course, gadolinium enhancement. What's gadolinium doing? You're never seeing gadolinium. When gadolinium leaks out into a, say, a brain tumor with a leaky blood-brain barrier, there's protons in that area. And what's happening is gadolinium's acting as a sink for them to quickly get rid of their energy. So it's shifting 
the T1 relaxation curve of the CSF in the area or CSF or you know, protons to the left. That's what it's doing. That's why gadolinium works. All right, so here's a cool case. Um, and I'm not showing it to you to, to quiz you. Uh, so we've got this hyperdense uh, mass, of hyperdense, hyperintense mass in the center of the brain on this T1 weighted image. The corpus callosum is dysmorphic. So this is a large lipoma of the corpus callosum. All right, so the reason I'm showing you this is because I'm saying if there's something in the head that's bright, not quite so obvious as this case, how can you prove it's fat? All right, you could always do a CT scan, that would work. But let's say you don't want to do a CT, what can you do? Well, here's the thing, ways in which fat differs from water. It differs in frequency. It has a phase difference then, because if it differs in frequency, they're going to go in and out of phase, right, at every certain periodic time. And then it differs in the T1. As we've already said, fat has a really short T1. So that could help us. So let's look, um, first of all, this is like a, uh, if I image your brain or your back or you, any patient, any person in here, this would be the signal that I would get out. So the majority of signals coming from water and the water pretty much looks the same as far as spectroscopy is concerned. There's not a whole lot of variation in water. Um, the fat is going to process at a lower frequency. And the reason for that is because the hydrogens on the water molecule are being drawn towards the electronegative oxygen. They are de-shielded. Those nuclei are experiencing the full brunt of the magnetic force, and therefore they have a higher precession frequency. So they're what we call, they're what we call downfield on in spectroscopy terms. Fat, on the other hand, you've got long aliphatic side chains for the most part. This is aliphatic fat in this area. And the electron cloud is covering basically protecting those protons from the magnetic field. Therefore, they process at a lower frequency. So if you're at three Tesla, the difference here is 440 hertz. If you're at 1.5, it's 220 hertz. You get the idea of scaling linearly, right? By the time we get down to the 0.3 Tesla, the low field magnets, I can't separate them anymore. So another reason why we don't like low field. <laughs> and I, I, think that, I think this graph is very important. So when you go to lower Tesla magnets, it's very hard to do chemical, this is chemical shift fast saturation. Right. So, and, and that, that's kind of the keys that we use for, for gadolinium. So that's, and also gadolinium at lower Tesla magnets will, will be seen a lot less, right? Because it, it, it is, it, it cannot affect the protons as much in, in the, those very low magnetic fields. And, and that's kind of one of the biggest reasons why we, we tend to start at 1.5 Tesla uh, is because we can do all of these experiments much easier and it's much better clinically. Um, so one of the ways Roy can tell that this is a chemical fat saturated image is see how it's losing some of the fat sat wherever there's an air interface. So, so chemical fat sat, in other words, sending in a saturation pulse targeting this fat depends on a very homogeneous magnetic field. If I try to do this around pedicle screws, forget about it. <laughs> it's not going to work. In fact, I probably get a reversal uh, and get the water saturated. Uh, but that's how I could tell. But this is proof positive that this is fat. All right, we're going to come back to that in the case that I saw in just a second. Uh, Kate, yeah. if there was a, a craniopharyngioma with cholesterol clefts, would it have saturated that, or is that fat different from a lipoma? If, 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 if there's enough fat, it will. It depends. It, yeah. It, it, it should be able to fat it. Yeah, it, it totally depends. Um, uh, sometimes I don't, I don't see them saturate and I don't, you know, it just yeah, depends. But, but if there's enough, I mean, that, that's how you can. How much fat is there? Yeah. Right. So, so that's how you differentiate dermoid from epidermoid. But, but right. if, if you, but there's sometimes there's a mixture of, of substances in there. There has to be enough concentration of fat to be able to make it happen. That's right. And, and, and how would you know unless you took it out and looked at it, right? <laughs> so, so it becomes, becomes difficult. All right. So now for the residents, here you go. Um, if you're a kind of person who wants a mnemonic for your boards, this is a really good one. Um, if you've seen a mnemonics before that only have three lines, this is really committed, hyperacute, and early subacute. Why? Because these are transient blood products. So they probably admitted that if you've got a three-line um, memorization device. 
The thing I hate about these things, these type of uh, memory devices is because of a year from now, I'm probably gonna get it confused, right? And worse yet, if you're looking at MRI in the middle of the night, the patient's not doing well, what is there about this mnemonic that makes you think blood products? So I really don't like it. Um, so I'm gonna try to give you another way to think about it and, and with stuff you already know, all right? So I think you know when you slice open an artery, bright, bright red blood comes out, right? <laughs> okay, that's oxygenated hemoglobin. So think about it as the oxygen is hiding or covering up the iron. And it literally is because the iron's in the ferrous plus two oxidation state. If, if, it's binding, uh, if it's binding oxygen, if the iron's doing that, there's no unpaired electrons. Unpaired electrons are the source of magnetic field in homogeneity, the source of magnetic susceptibility. So right now, oxygen is shielding the iron. As you know, oxygenated hemoglobin very rapidly converts to deoxygenated hemoglobin, right? Like starts in maybe three hours, completes 12 hours. Well, now, oh, there it is. Uh, the iron is now fully exposed, and this is going to cause massive field and homogeneity due to the fact they're like, you know, it's iron. You just put iron inside the magnet, basically. Uh, so that accounts for the change for the first time that we actually can see this iron and see the hemoglobin and get suspicious that it is it is blood products. All right. So let's look again at the hyperacute hematoma now less than 12 hours. It's iso intense on the T1 because there's no med hemoglobin yet. It's oxygenated hemoglobin. And on the T2 weighted images, it's getting a little brighter primarily because of the protein content. Uh, so you could just say this is a mass with some edema around it and not really know what it is. Now, the CT won't be full. It'll be like a big, you know, hyperdense clot. Uh, but in any event, there is a clue. See that little black line around it? So clots age peripherally first. So let's go look at the GRE sequence. Oh, okay, there we go. So now we've got what we call blooming, right? It's getting, the black areas are getting bigger and blacker. So this suggests to us that there is something that's causing magnetic susceptibility. Um, so could it be deoxyhemoglobin? Uh, good bet. Um, this is a diffusion weighted image showing that acute blood does restrict. Okay, it does restrict on diffusion. So now uh, the acute hematoma, the second we get more and more deoxyhemoglobin, it's going to start to fill in that clot. So we're going to go from iso intense. Why? Because there's no methemoglobin yet. Uh, too dark. Why? Because deoxyhemoglobin is powerfully, uh, has powerful magnetic susceptibility. That's why it got black and then there's some edema around it. Gets a little bigger or blacker on the GRE. Is it restricting on the DWI? And I, this is like, you could, you could talk about this a long period of time. Just like there's, you know, on the DWIs, when you look at them, the tumor's really, really bright. And we have to look at the ADC map because we talk about T2 shine through. Well, you could also get T2 blackout. So I think this is no information. I think this is T2 blackout and you've got paramagnetic susceptibility artifact. Look how the pattern of edema is different than this high signal um, on the, on the uh, diffusion weighted image. That's because this is magnetic susceptibility artifact in addition to edema. So it just proves that, well, furthermore that there's blood products because the diffusion weighted image has strong diffusion gradients. It's going to cause dephasing when there's something in the environment that has magnetic susceptibility. Now at two to three days, met, this heralds the arrival of med hemoglobin. So you're going from a ferrous iron to ferric iron can no longer bind to oxygen, the med hemoglobin, and it's the only blood product that's bright on T1. So it's bright, initially it's bright on T1 and really, really black on the T2 weighted images. Why? Because it's paramagnetic and it's uh, captured still or encapsulated still inside the red blood cells, which augments or change the magnetic field strength. At seven days, something uh, really cool happens. All the red blood cells lose their membrane integrity, begin to lie. So around seven days, around one week, and now the hematoma becomes bright on the T1 because it's met hemoglobin and stays bright on the T2 weighted image. If you look at the GRE, you see a black ring now around this hemorrhage. That's, that's a big clue that that's what we're looking at because that's a hemocytorin ring. And as this hematoma ages, it's going to get liquefied. It's going to turn more like fluid and the hemocytorin ring is going to collapse. And eventually all you're going to have is a little smear of uh, ferritin and hemocytorin. 
Okay, got to hurry. All right. Um, this is uh, to just give you an idea how this works. Uh, this is T1 weighted image and the hematoma is bright, black <coughs> of the T2 and has uh, evidence of susceptibility. So this is met hemoglobin because it's T1 bright. And then I look at the T2, it's dark still, so it's intracellular. So I know that I'm early subacute, two to seven days. All right, this particular case, I don't see anything on the T1. Oh, I'm earlier now than two days because there's no amount of hemoglobin yet, right? And then it got really black. So this just confirms that it's suspicious for blood products and it's intracellular deoxyhemoglobin. This only works, this time I'm giving you, the timestamp only works for an intracranial hemorrhage that is not complicated. If something in there is still bleeding, then you could have deoxyhemoglobin if well beyond five days. So that's a problem, right? But it's also a nice, beautiful thing. So if a hematoma is not aging as you suspect, then you might wonder, is something repetitively bleeding in that area? Um, anything else to say about hemorrhages? No. All right, do I have time for one more case? Maybe one. Okay, one, okay, sorry. <laughs> as, 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 as Jacques said, he will tell you. So this is a case, this is a case that Jessica sent me. Um, and this had been called a cord hemorrhage. And it's bright on the T1, bright on the T2. So you might think, okay, well, maybe it is. If it is blood, then it's what? It's so extracellular methemoglobin late subacute, right? All right, so a uh, patient had had symptoms of body numbness a few days before. That wouldn't really fit, no symptoms before that. And then she got, she got better, completely better. So here's where things went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, the outside radiologist looks, you know, we look at the T2s, right? And then we look at the GREs, and if we see things getting blacker, we typically think blood. So he concludes that it's hemorrhage on the basis of that. Remember? There was no fat sack. Ah, okay. Here we go. So the first thing I do is I start looking for my tools. Absolutely right. So the first thing I do is I look for my sagittal T2 with chemical fat sac. Tell us chemical fat sac because it's losing it posteriorly. And what happened on the T2? It's bright. It got darker. There's really no other explanation for that than it's fat. All right. But we're going to go beyond that. We look at the axial T1s. Pre-contrast, no fat sac. But post-contrast, they did get fat sac. And wow, got really, really black, didn't it? Again, no other explanation. Um, and then finally, we have the chemical shift artifact. So if this is the frequency encoding direction and this is fat, it's going to shift. It's going to lie to the magnet and shift to the lower field uh, location because the magnet only is tuned to water. It doesn't, if fat processes at a lower frequency, it doesn't know that. So it's going to place the fat as if it's water. So it's going to shift to low field. So you get a signal void and you get signal piling up. Uh, I can prove that by the next time you look at your axial uh, T2 weighted images, I want you to look in, for this little black line. The dura is probably not thicker on one side than it is on the other. It's probably not the answer. Uh, what's happening is the fat around the fecal sac is shifting to the left and it's leaving a signal void. And on this side, it's piling up. So in any event, why did the, this hematoma get so dark on the GRE images? And remember I told you that the GRE images do not refocus chemical shift. Was the, they, re, do, they do not refocus magnetic field and homogeneity. They do not refocus like evidence of blood or metal in the, in the environment, but they also do not refocus the chemical shift. So because these fat protons are processing at a different frequency than water, they're getting out of phase. And getting out of phase means getting black. The, the T2 um, fast spin echo images will rephase. They will get rid of this artifact. The GREs will not. Um, and you can see on SWI, you can see you can see uh, like a ruptured dar dermoid, and you'll see you know what looks like blood all over the place in the subarachnoid space, and it's just fat turning really black on the SWI. So. So in conclusion, uh, fat versus med hemoglobin, get a CT scan, right? <laughs> if worse comes to worse, we're not going to mistake fat. Uh, does it follow fat sequence signal on every single sequence? Is there a chemical shift artifact? Is it evolving as expected? Those fat lesions I showed you don't typically evolve, right? <laughs> so um, we can do chemical fat set. That's perfect. We can do Dixon fat set. That's perfect. We can't do STIR because STIR suppresses anything with a short T1. Doesn't matter. Methemoglobin, 
proteinaceous fluid, anything. So that, that's not going to help. And we can't rely on the heme sequence, the GRE, because it's also going to get darker. So, so I think I better stop there or Roy's going to kill me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.